Uh, my name is David Eric Nelson. I'm the author of Snip, Burn, Solder, Shred, Seriously Geeky Stuff to Make with Your Kids. I um, want to take a second at the start here just to thank O'Reilly for putting this all together and my publisher, No Starch. Um, they're a great company, and if you're a writer, they really make you work to, to, to make your book just kind of the best uh, version of what it can possibly be, so they're a good value. <laughs> um, that's a picture of me if you walked in late. Um, I wish I could say uh, I'm more handsome in future, but I'm afraid that that's just exactly what I look like. And here's what we're going to be talking about today. This is the $10 electric guitar. Uh, the goal of this talk is to, uh, you know, kind of like a cooking show, step you through the process of building it, discuss a little bit about the materials um, and the decisions that we're making while we build it, um, so that later on you can download the uh, PowerPoint deck from this presentation. You can watch the video on YouTube. You can take some notes and screenshots. After we're done talking today, you'll be able to build this yourself. Um, to give you a sense of what this actually sounds like, let's go to the video. And there we are. And hopefully we're going back to the deck soon. <laughs> so hopefully you can forgive uh, my poor guitar playing. And we can all agree that that sounds suitably guitarish for something that is essentially a stick bolted to a cookie tin. Um, let's start out with a little bit of anatomy here. Uh, on stringed instruments in general, although we're using this diddly bow, which is what this type of one string electric guitar is called, or electric one string guitar in general. Um, you know, clearly the top of the neck is the head, the bottom is the butt. Tuning peg people are familiar with. What I kind of want to point out is at the very top of the neck is um, a, a little piece of wood in our case uh, called the nut, and at the bottom is the saddle. Um, people most guitars, electric guitars and acoustic guitars, the saddle and the bridge are single integrated unit, so people don't tend to think of them as separate. The bridge is what anchors the guitar string at the butt of the instrument and the tuning peg at the top. The saddle and the nut keep the strings from sliding around in a multi-string instrument so they're not buzzing against each other and also give you a little bit of rise off of the fingerboard, that's the, the action of the instrument so that you don't get fret buzz again. Um, Here's sort of the pro tip on electric guitar tone. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we think when we think of a guitar, we invariably think of the shape of the body, and that's sort of the idea of the guitar to us. Um, the body has almost no impact on the sound of an electric guitar. Uh, you're going to get 75% of the sound that makes that guitar distinctive as an instrument comes from the pickups and strings, which is why professional guitarists get so wrapped up in using specific brands of strings um, and making specific modifications to pickups. Like Eddie Van Halen is famous for all the dinking he's done to the pickups on his guitars to get just the sound that he wants. Um, another 15% of that sound is going to come from the neck, um, a quality hardwood neck. Um, and then like the remaining 10% is miscellaneous factors, <laughs> um, which is sort of how it was characterized to me by several luthiers. Um, and that includes the entire body of the instrument, the hardware, the bridge design and composition, electronics. Um, so really what we're focusing on in this project is the pickups and strings and neck, because that's where the sound's really coming from. <coughs> Here's a view of the tools we're going to use. Um, again, this is a, a flexible project. Uh, the diddly bow is an American folk instrument, and so really flexibility is the key, and the blues is a, is a flexible music form. So this is in a way just a guideline here um, to actually step through what we've got. Tool-wise, you're going to want an electric drill, and there's really no way to get around that. <laughs> um, and you're going to want half inch, three eighths inch, and three sixteenth inch bits. You're also going to want 100 grit sandpaper. Um, Things are going to go faster if you have an electric sander. 
Uh, but again, that's not vital if you're willing to put a, a little bit of elbow grease into this. You're going to need a wood saw. This uh, tool along the bottom of the image is a Ryoba. It's a Japanese pull saw, which sounds really fancy. They're super, super common because they're really popular for doing like uh, trim work um, around cabinetry and such because they're flexible and they have a narrow kerf. It means the blade is narrow. Um, because you're cutting on the pull instead of the push. You can use any old wood saw you have sitting around, you know, CR saw you take camping, whatever is handy. You're going to need a soldering kit. This is not a soldering heavy project. Um, and in fact, all you're doing soldering wise is connecting the pickup you're going to wind, which is a legitimate electromagnetic pickup, just like any guitar in Guitar Center. You're going to have to solder it to the guitar jack. Um, so that's going to take a soldering iron and some solder and wire strippers. Um, you're also going to want to have a working stove and a jar and a pot of water because we need to melt the beeswax to pot the pickup. Um, you need two kinds of glue here, Gorilla Glue and Cyanoacrylate adhesive. Cyanoacrylate is, is crazy glue, um, and we'll discuss later why we're using two different kinds of glue at two different stages here. Also some electrical tape. Um, a chromatic tuner is optional. If you actually want to be in a specific key when you're playing, <laughs> you're going to want to be able to tune up that string, um, although because the way the neck's laid out, the instrument will be in tune with itself. There's only one string here. Um, there's lots of JavaScript-based chromatic tuners available online, so it's not like something you got to go drop 20 bucks on. Additionally, Gibson Guitar used to have a really cool free iPhone app that included both a really nice chromatic tuner and a really nice metronome, so I put that out there. Um, and optional-ish <laughs> is some sort of amplifier, because you are building an electrified instrument here. Um, Although, like if you have an old set of computer speakers that are the kind that are powered, those have an amplifier built into them. And so, you know, you can play through those or your stereo or whatever you can plug an external source into. Supplies for building this. And again, I want to stress that uh, there's a lot of flexibility here. So I want to kind of highlight the things that, that aren't flexible. Um, you're going to want about three feet of finish grade hardwood one by two. This is the neck. You want hardwood because something soft like pine um, the guitar string is going to cut right into it <laughs> and you're not going to be able to get a good tone because when you press down on that string you're going to press it right into the neck. Um, finish grade is like uh, what people use when they're doing trim work or hardwood floors. It's what you're actually going to see. That means it's going to be free of knots, the grain's going to be tight, and it's unlikely that it's going to be torqued or twisted or dried funny so that it's crooked. Um, if you go to like a legitimate lumber yard and explain like I'm making this crazy instrument I heard about online, I need a piece of finished grade hardwood, they'll be able to hook you up. Um, usually these things are sold in like nine foot lengths. I don't think I've ever paid more than six or seven bucks bucks for nine feet, which is enough to make you know three uh, ten dollar electric guitars. You're also going to want a three eighths inch hardwood dowel. This is going to be the saddle. Again, because the strings can be putting a lot of pressure on it, we want to go with hardwood. Um, a couple of large kitchen matches. This is what I use for the nut. I know it sounds ridiculous because kitchen matches are so soft, but um, I've been making these for years and I've never had a kitchen match nut break on me. Um, in a traditional uh, like acoustic guitar, the nut and saddle are very frequently made out of ox bone, which is really hard. And in fact, you can get bone blanks at most guitar shops that you know carry supplies for people to do little repairs, and that's always an option. Um, the cookie tin or similar container is just going to serve as the body. It makes it easier to hold the instrument. In a lot of ways, it's entirely optional. Um, and then you, of course, want a steel ball end acoustic guitar string. Steel, because the pickup is magnetic. Um, ball end, as will become obvious later, so that it can be secured on the neck. Um, for the bridge, I'm calling here for 3 8 inch round-headed bolt washer and nut, which is the kind of bolt washer and nut right in the middle there. You can use any diameter that you find <laughs> sitting around your house or easy to get at your hardware store. You're just going to adjust how big of a hole you drill um, in the center of that tin and for the bridge bolt on the neck. The tuning peg. We're going to discuss this later, but this homemade tuning peg actually works incredibly well. <laughs> um, it's a much better investment for the 32 cents worth of parts than buying a friction peg. Um, you can also go with a store-bought tuning peg, and we'll discuss that when we get to tuning peg. Finally, making the pickup. Um, and I just want to stress that a lot of times when people have like cigar box guitar designs online or other diddly bows, they amplify them with these peso pickups. It's an acoustic pickup they build by cutting up a, a buzzer they buy from Radio Shack. I, I hate those things. <laughs> They're noisy, they have very poor low-end response, and they don't sound especially like an actual electric guitar. This is an honest-to-God uh, magnetic 
pickup, just like in any old electric guitar. It's 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 a very similar design to like um, what was initially proposed by like Leo Fender. Um, of course, it's updated because we can make it a lot easier than Fender could because uh, we have much more powerful magnets, much more available, much more cheaply now. So the supplies for this, you want a playing card, 135 feet of 42 cage enameled wire, um, which is the one tricky supply here, and we'll discuss that later. Uh, two small neodymium magnets. Um, I use 8 millimeter by 3 millimeter discs, pretty much any small neodymium, which are those super magnets or rare earth magnets, will work in most hardware stores and uh, even like uh, gas stations. <laughs> it seems to sell them now. Um, about uh, an ounce of beeswax. Um, again, easier to get than you think necessarily. And then some 24 gauge stranded insulated wire, which is the kind of standard doing electrical work around the house wire you'll find for sale, of course, at Radio Shack. Um, and a quarter inch guitar jack, which again, you can buy at Radio Shack. Step one, sanding and marking. Pro tip here is to borrow an electric sander from someone. So we're going to start out, um, look at that that hardwood one by two you've got and decide which side is prettier, because that's going to be the face of your instrument. Um, mark that with some pencil so you know which side you chose, flip it over, and as you see in this diagram here, you know, you've got the long left and right sides. You want to sand those down on the back of this neck. Um, because you're going to run your hand up and down this instrument a lot while you're playing and uh, that sharp corner on the hardwood is, is going to cut you <laughs> over time so you want to take that down till it's nice and smooth think of like a the bottom of a boat you know kind of that sort of curve to it if you don't have an electric sander um, start out by uh, taking out your old Swiss Army knife and running running it down those edges just to take it down a little before you start sanding. That'll speed it up. Um, you can also do the front long edges. Uh, it really doesn't have a huge impact on playing, but you definitely want to do the back. Additionally, you're going to want to sand down the section that I have circled here on the lower left. Um, when you start playing, you end up resting your wrist on that a lot um, of your strumming hand. So you're going to want to sand it down. <laughs> Um, once everything's sanded down, flip it over so your instruments face up. Um, and we're going to add some lines here. The three lines we're adding are to mark where the nut, saddle, and bridge are going to be placed. So you can see these measurements off to the side. Um, take a screenshot or download the deck later so that you actually have these in hand when you're working. Um, and then we're going to add the dots. These are position markers for playing this right here with the open string and then these six dots will give you one full octave of the blues scale. Um, that's really handy if you listen to American music or, or if you grew up in the United States. Um, blues music is really embedded centrally in most of our popular music, um, in our folk music and in our rock music and its structures and so it's going to appeal to your ear immediately and you'll find that you can really easily start monkeying around tunes uh, in the blues scale. If you want to tape it, take it one step further, um, and this is what I do on a lot of my diddly bows, I also add the major and harmonic minor scales. Um, and so here I've got another chart, take a screen cap or get the deck later, that gives a rundown on where you'd place dots so you can play these scales as well. The major scale, um, pretty much any American folk song you think of is 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 in the major scale, so like Frankie and Johnny, or um, when the Saints come marching in. And then harmonic minor scale is really uh, common with Eastern European folk songs, so like Havnagila, which is the only Eastern European uh, folk song that jumps to mind for me, <laughs> is uh, is one that's in a harmonic minor scale. Um, bonus, and this isn't even in the book. Um, when I mentioned this webcast on Facebook, uh, one of my friends who's a luthier. Adam Stein, who's the guy who helped me figure out some of the stuff when I was designing for the book, suggested that I might want to point people towards the really easy way to actually go full fret on this, to fully fret out this neck like an electric guitar, which will give you, you know, the full set of chromatic notes. Um, and I'm going to discuss at the tail end kind of in terms of formula what to do here, but it's actually really insanely easy, <laughs> which is that you're going to, if you want to mark out that full fret, you take the full scale length, that's the distance from the nut to the saddle in this case, because our saddle and bridge are not integrated, which is 25 inch inches on a standard acoustic guitar and 25 inches on our instrument, and you divide that by 18. 
and you'll get like 1.3 something, and that's how many inches from the nut to your first fret. Then take that remaining distance, divide it by 18, it'll be, you know, 1.3 something slightly lower, and that's the distance from fret 1 to fret 2, and you just continue doing that till you have 20 frets. Again, uh, I'll hit that at the end when I talk about modifications to the instrument. And if you do decide to add frets, and this is something I haven't had a chance to monkey around with, um, I know a lot of people have a good experiences uh, with gluing down hunks of uh, bamboo barbecue skewer and using those as frets. Um, additionally, I had a friend who claimed to have once used chunks of coat hanger, which strikes me as slightly uh, larger gauge wire than you'd want, like a wire coat hanger from the dry cleaner, but he might have uh, might have been actually grinding down the neck a little bit in slots to place them in. Um, so now we're to step two, uh, drilling the neck. Um, my pro tip here is to rough the sand the rough edges now. Um, I don't know about everyone else, but I always get really excited uh, when I'm working on a project and I kind of, you know, do the minimum and then want to move forward saying like, oh, I'll clean it up and make it look nice later. And, um, and then I never want to take it apart later to clean it up and make it look nice, so I end up with splinters all over everything. Um, so yeah, the pro tip here is when you're drilling the holes, uh, just sand them right then and, and don't assume you're going to come back to it. Um, so henceforward, we're going to assume that you're looking at the neck of your instrument in front of you and that you've laid it down with the head to your left, the butt to your right, and the face is up. So that surface where you marked out uh, your position markers is facing up towards you. We're going to put uh, three holes in this. Two of them are 3 16th inch holes, and the last one is the half inch hole. So on the nut line, and you can look at this handy diagram, uh, one half down from the far edge and one half left of the nut line is where that first half inch hole goes, and that's where your tuning peg is, is, is going to be placed. The second hole is a half inch above the saddle line, so it's at the butt of the instrument, and about a quarter of an inch in from the near edge, and that's the hole that the wires from your guitar pickup are going to slide through. Last hole is right in the center of the bridge line. It's a half inch hole. It's for the bridge bolt. If you elected to use a different size bolt for your bridge, then you're going to want a different size hole here. Step three, building the tuning peg. Um, believe it or not, this homemade tuning peg is actually better than a store-bought friction peg. What am I talking about? Uh, these are two store-bought guitar pegs. The one on the left is a friction peg. You'll see these on a lot of cheap guitars. Um, you also see them very frequently on ukuleles, instruments that don't have nearly as much tension in the strings. Um, just like it sounds, when you turn that to get to the note that you want, the only thing that's keeping you from just sliding right back is friction. You contrast that to the guy on the right, which is a geared tuning machine. As you can see, it's got gears um, so that when you tune it up, it holds the, it stays in tune much better over time because there's more than just the simple friction of the peg uh, keeping it from drifting out of tune. Um, for example, when you've got friction pegs, very frequently like even with a ukulele, a, a low tension instrument, after every song you'll be tuning your instrument back up because the friction pegs don't hold very well and over time they get looser and looser because they're actually depending on a little plastic grommet here which of course is going to get ground down. Tuning machines pretty much last forever. Um, so if you have tuning pegs kicking around your house, um, you can use one for this instrument. You'll probably need to drill the hole a little bit larger for the tuning peg in the drilling the next stage. Um, one thing you want to be aware of is that this 1x2 is a bit thicker than the headstock on a standard electric guitar, so um, if you have like a geared tuning peg, it's going to have to have a slightly abnormally long post. There's just ones with longer and shorter posts. So if you go to your guitar shop to buy one and it'll cost you a couple bucks, you know, bring a, a ruler with you and make sure it'll actually fit. Um, actually building our friction peg, this, you know, making the friction peg sandwich. Um, again, this particular friction peg, because it's squeezing washers in on either side, um, actually holds a lot, lot better than a store-bought friction peg. Like my, my electric guitars, my diddly bows never drift out of tune. It just shocks me because this is so cheap and easy. So what you're going to do is take that uh, number 10 eye bolt, the 3 16 eye bolt, and again, if you have an easier time finding something bigger or smaller than this, then go with it, whatever you can find. Um, you're going to drop one of your number 10 washers on it. You're going to slide it into the neck from the front, so that's the side where you've put your position markers. Drop on the other washer, spin on that wing nut, and you're good to go. 
Here's a picture of it in operation from the front. It can be a little awkward to tune these at first because you kind of you need both hands in order to tighten the bolt from front and back. Um, but again, it's it's a really great tuning peg. Props to my dad who has never played a musical instrument in his life, but when he looked at the prototype I built of this, had the suggestion he's a, a builder. So thank you, dad. Step four is cutting the saddle, which is really easy. It's just that uh, hardwood dowel, and you're going to cut it to one and three quarters inches long, which is the full width of your instrument neck. Step five is drilling the resonator. Um, the resonator is that body, and for this I use a cookie tin. This resonator only adds a little bit of volume. I didn't want to have anything else throwing sound into the mix because I was looking for a real sort of roadhousey guitar sound. Um, it helps to have something to rest on your lap when you're playing, and it helps to have a little more volume so that when you're you know, tuning up or monkeying around and don't feel like getting up and turning on your amp or digging something out, you can play. If you want to go acoustic electric, I strongly urge you to replace this tin with a cigar box. Um, they're cheap. Most cigar shops don't give them away anymore, but they'll sell them for a buck or two. And what you're going to look for is a cigar box that's large, especially that's got some depth to it. Um, and of course made out of wood. Most brands now use wood boxes. It's a thin, cheap wood, but it resonates really well. So um, use that in place of this tin can resonator and you'll actually have a, a pretty nice acoustic instrument right there that you can also plug in and rock out. Drilling the holes in the tin. Half inch hole goes right in the middle of the top and that's how the bridge bolt is going to connect the neck to the body. Um, on the tail end of the instrument here, you can see on the front face, um, there's a 3 8 inch hole. That's for the guitar jack. Um, you could also put that on the face of the instrument. Depends on how you want to plug in later. Um, for a real kind of advanced mode, you can, if you know how to solder a bit more and want to build an amplifier, um, you can actually integrate an amplifier into this instrument. Um, I've built some like that for friends. Who, who don't have amps and stuff, and they really love them because it's so easy to travel with. You just toss it in the car, and then, you know, you're all punk rock at the picnic. Um, that last hole at about 1 o'clock from the half-inch hole through the middle is a 3 sixteenths, 3 sixteenths hole that's going to have to line up with the pickup wire hole you drilled in the neck. Easiest way to do this is to, uh, you know, put your neck on top of this can, drop the bolt in, and then line it up and use a pencil to drop a little mark right through that pickup hole you already drilled so that everything lines up ultimately. Step six, we're just going to bolt it all together and then uh, string it up. So this is an interior view of how, how it's going to look. You're going to um, lay the can down bottom up, um, line up that half inch bridge bolt hole in the neck with the half inch hole in the can, um, slide the ball end of the guitar string through the hole and then follow it with the bolt. Flip it over, slide the washer on so that you're sandwiching that string down, and then crank down your wing nut. Here's the view of that from the top. Um, and you'll notice that the, the string is kind of off-center. Totally doesn't make a difference if you're making a one-string model, but we're going to talk in the mod section about upgrading this to two strings. Uh, at which time you might want to be a little more careful jinking things around or even slot the saddle so that the strings stay where you want them to be. Next, stringing it up. And um, this method of stringing a steel stringed instrument holds for any uh, stringed instrument. Um, it doesn't seem obvious when you have like a single string diddly bow, but once you add another string, or certainly with a guitar, people do crazy things stringing them up um, and that actually contributes to them not wanting to stay in tune and putting weird torque on the neck and again you know when you've spent a little bit under 10 bucks to build it you might not care if the neck gets all torqued you'll you know you've got two extra necks <laughs> you can just build a new one um, but if you have a 400 dollar guitar you want to string it right so you've got that string dangling from the bridge bolt you're gonna run it up to the eye bolt take up all the slack and then back it off by an inch so you've got some slack bring that free end of the wire up and around. It's going to go counterclockwise under the string and kink it back up. Now you're going to turn the eye bolt clockwise in order to start pulling the slack out and this is going to lock that string up uh, right against the wire. Um, oh, and you're going to have some spare dangly string afterwards. You're going to want to cut that. Don't ever try to cut a guitar string with uh, the wire snippers out of your soldering kit because it matches them and, and ruins them. Guitar strings are made out of steel um, and they're much, much harder. You need to use like 
tin snips <laughs> to cut them off. Or you can just coil up the spare wire, which I frequently do because I'm not prone to go and find the right tool for the right job. Once you've taken out the slack, you're going to slide the nut, which is that matchstick, up to line up with the nut line and the saddle to line up with the saddle line. Um, and gosh, I should have mentioned this earlier. Uh, a lot of times people find it makes it easier if they um, run the saw once or twice over that nut and saddle line just after they've drawn them so that the uh, dowel and the matchstick kind of have a little place they can set into. It's not mission critical, um, but it can make things easier later. And then you're going to tune her up. Um, I originally designed this using a G guitar string. Uh, oh, bridge installed. Um, and so if you're using a G string, I'd suggest tuning it to G. If you're not uh, familiar with string instruments in general, be aware that the first G that you hit when you're tuning it up is going to be the, the G below the normal G on a guitar. So it's actually like the, uh, the G on a bass guitar. Is there a G on a bass guitar? Um, and then the next one up is going to be a normal G. If you've never played a string instrument before, stick with that lower G at first. It'll be easier to play because it won't have as much tension in it. Um, but you're going to get a better sound if you tune it up. Um, the a note about getting guitar strings, most guitar shops also have guitar lessons. So <laughs> um, if you need to get a guitar string, um, try first just asking at the shop if they have any kicking around in the trash because a lot of guitarists, they very frequently break the highest strings on the instrument and infrequently break the lower strings like the E, the A, the D, and the G, the ones that are wound. And a lot of times they change all the strings at once. Um, also, most shops will sell a single string, or you can just buy a whole packet, and then you've got room to experiment and add other strings later. So here's sort of a picture of where we're at in the design now. The bridge has been installed, the, the saddle's in place, the nut's in place at the top. We're all tuned up, and we're ready to build the pickup, which is maybe what people are here to hear about, because um, the first half of the instrument's clearly pretty simplistic. <laughs> um, this is a lot, lot easier than you think. Um, luthiers and guitar people tend to sort of make it out like as though Hercules, you know, cut the heads off the hydra, and then he went and cleaned out those stalls, and then he tried to build a guitar pickup and failed. That it's just like the most impossible thing. And part of that is because, um, you know, they're sound freaks and gearheads, and they're going for a certain um, really precise sound or uh, uh, specific kind of uh, responsiveness that we're not going for as people who are tinkering and building something to build. Um, so it's actually significantly, significantly easier than, than you've been led to believe in the past. Um, so here's step one. Um, you're going to want to take that playing card and cut two one-inch circles out of it. Um, if you don't have a compass, uh, you can just trace a quarter. Um, and then you're going to make the magnetic yo-yo. <laughs> so take your two little magnets, stack them on top of each other, um, and then use a little dab of crazy glue on the top of you know your top magnet. Put your playing card on, flip it over, put your other dab of crazy glue on. Um, I use 8 millimeter by 3 millimeter disc magnets. Why did I use these? Because they were the ones that were at my hardware store and were cheapest. Um, Tom Clark, who did the technical build on this, used something completely different and it turned out just fine. The key is that you want these neodymium magnets, these rare earth or super magnets. They have a much more powerful magnetic field, which is why our pickup will only have 1,500 windings on it as opposed to 5,000, which is sort of the industry standard for making a pickup. Um, so it'll take a minute or two for your uh, magnetic yo-yo to dry off, so set it aside. and get prepared to do the winding. Um, 1,500 winding sounds like a lot. Please don't freak out about this. <laughs> um, it's not very time consuming and it's not very hard. Um, it's going to take 135 feet of 42 gauge enameled wire to do this. This is like the one tricky ingredient to all this. 42 gauge wire is really, really thin. Um, it's about the thickness of a human hair. Depending on the quality of your hair, it has slightly higher or lower tensile strength. <laughs> um, you, this isn't common. They don't sell it at Radio Shack. Um, most guitar shops aren't going to have it kicking around unless they do heavy duty repair. Um, you can buy it, but you tend to buy it in half pound spools, which are 25,000 feet 
of wire. A half pound spool is going to go you like 30 bucks new from Stuart McDonald, which is sort of the go-to place for luthiers. Um, getting supplies. You can find them on eBay sometimes for as low as like 20 bucks. Um, I sell them from my website for this book. Uh, I sell a, the proper lengths. It's actually a double length, so it's about 300 feet of pickup wire, so you can make two pickups or several pickups of different designs for about two or three bucks. Um, if you want to scrounge it, um, look at like old dog hair clippers, for example. Anything that's got a big beefy motor in it will very frequently be wound with suitable thin gauge wire. Additionally, old transformers or the, the electromagnets inside of relays. Also, old TVs. Now, my proviso, <laughs> an old CRT-based like TV or monitor is going to have an electromagnet in it in order to guide that stream of electrons to draw the picture. If you are not an electronics person, <laughs> do not ever, ever open up an old TV or CRT. Um, they've got big, beefy capacitors in them uh, that'll blast you. Um, so, that said, you know, scrounge from the dog clippers, tear up some old uh, transformers, um, or buy a huge spool and just end up splitting it with your friends. I find that once I have 25,000 feet of anything, I all of a sudden come up with all sorts of projects that I want to build with that 25,000 feet of wire. Um, additionally, uh, the tech reader who tested this project out for me, he used 38 gauge wire and got really good results. Now the way wire gauges work is kind of crazy, but every time that gauge goes down by six, um, it doubles the thickness of the wire. Right, so like 18 gauge wire, which is, um, you'll see in the hardware store, it's used on like ground connections and uh, home electrical installations. That's actually half as thick as 12 gauge wire, which is used in like some body piercings, like the, the big thick rings you see in a dude's ear. So, um, so Tom was using wire that was like 75% thicker than what I was, you know, almost twice as thick, and he got great results. So, um, you know, that 30 gauge wire that's at Radio Shack is going to be about four times as thick. I don't know if that enameled winding wire will work, but if people experiment with it and have good results or any results, um, please contact me because I'd love to tell people about it. Um, I guess the proviso there is um, as you go with a lower gauge wire, a thicker wire, you're going to need to add more windings in order to make this work. And um, I guess this is as good a time as any to, eh, we'll go to initial testing. So. <laughs> um, as far as the actual winding of this wire goes, um, if you're working carefully, in about five minutes you'll do 300 windings. Um, so, and that's just doing it by hand. And what I like to do is just like, I'd stick one of these to the side of my filing cabinet and wind it up. So like, go to Hulu, pick a Simpsons episode you haven't seen before, you know, stick your magnet to the side of your filing cabinet and start winding. By the end of that episode, you're going to be done. Um, Tom, who doesn't have my patience, <laughs> uh, actually stuck his pickup to the, the, the flywheel on his sewing machine and just ran the sewing machine slow and just brought the wire up until the spool, until the pickup looked about as full as what's in this picture here. Um, guys who make pickups for a living, sometimes what they'll do is they'll actually anchor it to a turntable, <laughs> take a few measurements uh, with the diameter, do a little math and figure out how quickly wire is going to be taken up on that spinning at 33 RPM and they just set it going and walk around, uh, walk away. And you can actually get um, really accurately matched pickups that way, which is cool if you want to build uh, like a humbucker setup, which requires two pickups that have the same number of windings going opposite directions. Um, so once you've got it all together, you're going to want to wire this up with wire that's not going to break nearly as easily as this winding wire. So, you know, take a couple pieces of the insulated wire, strip it, solder one end to one pickup on the lead, the other to either of the lugs, on the uh, the little places that you solder to on the quarter inch jack. Hook up the other lead to the other lug on the quarter inch jack using insulated wire and then we're going to test it. Um, the way that a guitar pickup works, um, you know, physical fact, when you have a moving current through a wire, um, that generates a magnetic field. And when you have a moving magnetic field passing over a wire, that generates a current in the wire, it induces a current. So what we've done here with this little magnetic yo-yo is we've taken some natural magnets with a magnetic field and we've wound a wire that's going to sit inside of that standing magnetic field. Now when your guitar string 
vibrates close to that pickup, it perturbs the magnetic field that the magnets have set up, uh, kind of like you're slapping your hand on the top of a, of a bathtub full of water. Um, and because that field's being perturbed at the same frequency that that wire's moving up and down, then it's that the waves in that in that that perturbed field uh, match the frequency the wire's moving at, and that frequency is the tone we hear. Um, and as that magnetic field moves back and forth, it pushes and pulls a current through the wire, and that's at the same frequency as the wire's moving, uh, as the guitar string is moving, and that's what the amplifier amplifies. So once you've got this hooked up plug it into an amplifier. And um, if you tap it, even with your non-magnetic finger, what you're going to find is that it makes all sorts of crazy clatter, which is not at all like an electric guitar. And this is because the wires in that coil, even though they're pretty tight and you can't see them moving, are shifting just enough against each other that they're moving through the standing magnetic field and they're inducing a current to go back and forth through that wire, and that's what's being amplified, which as an aside means you can actually make some kind of cool acoustic pickups using this design, um, which has a much fuller response than a peso pickup. That was the aside on that. Um, if you tap your pickup and you get no noise, um, don't panic yet. Um, take something magnetic, like a paper clip, and you know, drop that on it too. You should definitely get a big thunk from a magnetic paper clip, and it'll stick right to that pickup. Um, if neither work, then uh, probably you've either got a short where you soldered the jack to the insulated wires, the insulated wires to the leads, so check those. Um, and if there's not a short there, it means the wire was broken during the winding process, and you're going to just start again. Um, I've never broken a wire while winding a pickup, not even my first time building this, and other people who've built them using my instructions also haven't broken wires. Um, and frankly, if you mess up <laughs> and and break a wire, it's it's pretty obvious. You know, like you'll feel that you snagged on something, you know, and done something dumb right away. So it's very rare that there's a surprise at this stage that something isn't working. Um, once it's all tested out and it's working fine, you're going to want to wrap a little electric tape over one of those soldered points on the leads to the insulated wire, and um, wrap the spare 40, 42 gauge wire. Um, around your magnetic donut. It doesn't matter which way you wrap it. Then wrap one or two passes of that insulated wire with a knot so they all kinds of hold together. And then you're going to squirt some crazy glue in here, which is just going to hold things down for the next step, which is potting. Um, pro tip, if you don't want to get yelled at, do this uh, Do this over your uh, a piece of wax paper so that you don't end up gluing your pickup to your work table. Um, Note, crazy glue has an exothermic reaction with cotton and wool. So when it gets on cotton and wool, it creates heat and can even start to smoke and smolder. So if you're assigned to wear gloves, go with latex or rubber. Um, to pot the pickup, what potting means is that we're going to soak this pickup in wax so that uh, the wires don't make those little minute movements and create a whole bunch of noise whenever you tap the pickup. And we're going to use beeswax. Um, different people who make pickups have different opinions about the best mix of paraffin wax and beeswax. I don't think it matters. I used beeswax because I could get a big chunk from my local health food store. Um, I've talked to folks who've used like candle wax just from like those little tea candles, um, and I've had exactly the same results. So whatever you've got handy is going to work here. Um, you're going to set up a double boiler to do this because it's the easiest way to get wax warm, in my opinion. So take a pot. Put it on the pudding. Put it on the stove um, with a cup of water or two in it. Put your jar in it and toss your beeswax in there. Again, beeswax is really a lot easier to get a hold of than than people seem to think. Health food stores always have it. Craft stores frequently have it. If there are beekeepers in your area, they will have it. And if you live anywhere where there's agriculture, there's probably beekeepers. Um, also, you can get honey really cheap from them. So, pro tip: buy your honey from the beekeeper. Um, Set your stove to a uh, kind of medium, medium high, get the water boiling, and just leave the beeswax in there to melt. Pro tip, <laughs> don't leave beeswax or especially paraffin, which is a petroleum product, um, unattended. Uh, a beeswax fire is just like a grease fire, um, which means if your beeswax catches fire, and don't worry, there'll be warnings. If your beeswax starts to smoke, it is too damn hot. <laughs> Cut the heat, you're done for the day. <laughs> You'll be just fine. Um, but if it does start a fire, throw baking soda on it. 
Do not throw water on it because it will splash the flaming beeswax and it will spread the fire and that's uncool. Also, and I only mention this because my wife and I got an argument about it once while there was a fire, do not throw flour on it. Flour is combustible and you'll go from flour, you'll go from fire on the stove to small explosion on the stove and that's also uncool. So don't leave your beeswax unattended. If it starts to smoke, it's too hot. But the good news is that you can still use it because all you're doing is getting it liquid here. Once that beeswax is liquid, cut the heat, let it sit there, and we're going to start potting our pickup. This is another thing that I found a huge amount of voodoo related to. Um, people soaking pickups for hours on, you know, keeping low simmering heat. I haven't seen it to make a difference. I soak my pickup for one minute. You're going to see lots of tiny little bubbles come out. After a minute's up, there might still be some bubbles. I pick it up and let it drain. Then I repeat. Again, there'll be lots of little bubbles. After a minute, I pick it up, I let it drain for 30 seconds. You go three or four times, you're going to notice markedly fewer bubbles. Um, and that's because the wax is soaked in between those windings. Um, and you're good to go. Um, let your pickup rest so that it fully dries, or fully cools, <laughs> um, so that you're not burning yourself with hot wax. And then retest it. And what you're going to find is you're going to plug it into your amp. When you tap on it, there'll be no sound now. When you drop a paper clip on it, you'll get exactly the same big boom. Um, and that's great, because it means now your pickup is going to amplify the stuff you want amplified, which is the vibration of the string, and not amplify the stuff you don't want amplified, like your fingers rubbing against the fretboard. Um, installing the pickup is easy. Um, Gorilla Glue is great in this application. You are going to have to clip off the jack so you can string the wires through the two holes. Um, and then you're going to glue it down. If you've never used Gorilla Glue before, it expands by about 300% as it sets up and dries. So a little smear is going to do you, and if there's any little smeary lines of it that you don't want to see later, wipe them up now with, um, with a damp cloth. Cloth is fine with Gorilla Glue, although it's going to ruin it, so use an old rag. Because um, it's going to foam and expand and a little tiny dab at this stage is going to be a big ugly thing later that's going to be a real pain to chip off. Um, crazy glue and hot glue are not going to work here because they don't like sticking to the wax. Um, it's going to take about 24 hours for this to set up, which kind of makes this a two-day project. So once you're at this stage and you've positioned it, Gorilla Glue also is kind of slippery. Um, it's not like a it doesn't want to keep things in one place. It's like old epoxy that way. So use a little masking tape to uh, tape down your pickup and uh, you know, you can actually finish the soldering while that glue is still drying. Just be careful not to knock the pickup off. Um, or you can leave it till the next day. As far as wiring the pickup up goes, you're just going to install, um, rewire the jack, and then install it in the jack hole that you drilled, you know, 18 slides ago. Ta-da! This brings us to our completed instrument. Um, modifications. Uh, one is adding scales and frets, the other is adding strings. I know that people might feel a little bit cheated. This electric guitar has one freaking string. Um, the upside is that this is enough. This gives you a full octave and a half easily, two octaves if you've got strong hands um, in whatever note you've tuned that string to, so it opens up the entire world of folk music and blues. Um, beyond that, it's really easy to add a second string, and that's part of the design here. So as we discussed before, and again, get it from the PowerPoint deck, but here are other scales to add. I personally advocate adding the major and minor harmonic scales because it right away turns this into a, um, a, a very playable instrument that, in fact, um, you can use like dulcimer instructions to play because um, most dulcimers, I think, are fretted out to a, a major scale. Um, if you want to go full fret, Here's sort of the formula version, which is that you're going to take that nut to saddle length and divide it by 18 in order to get the number of inches that you measure from the nut to the first fret. Take that remaining length, divide it by 18, and that's going to give you the distance from the first fret to the second fret. Remaining length, divide by 18, uh, add infinitum, or really add 22. <laughs> um, uh, the cool thing about the rule of 18 is that it holds for pretty much any western stringed instrument. So if you decide to build a ukulele, um, which has a significantly smaller uh, scale length, this same rule will help you place the frets properly. Um, so, so that's kind of a nice all-purpose uh, tool there. Additionally, um, 
if you want to go really pro, it suggested that you use 17.817 instead of 18. I do not think that that is worthwhile here because um, part of the point of this instrument and part of the reason that I didn't use frets on it is that the intonation is really, really forgiving. So for a first time player, it's really easy to adjust your fingers up or down a little and get a nice sweet note, hit the spot that you're looking for. Um, and what you find when you remove frets from the mix is that for most applications in rocking out, close counts. <laughs> close really works well. Um, and it also means you can see cool slides. Um, hey, and in fact, these instruments are just... Oh, yep. Yes. You yes. seem like getting a lot of static over your... Uh, oh, really? Oh, really? Oh, gosh, gosh, yeah. sorry. Uh, it's is terrible. This is this helping at all? Oh, no, oh, no. no. <laughs> can you Here, check your I'm settings? Gonna, yeah, I can. Yeah, I can. Is that, help, is that helping at all? Um, no. It's, uh, it, uh, sounds terrible. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna plug in, plug in, replug. Is that okay? Is that okay? No, it didn't help. Are you still there? No, no it didn't help. Oh. Are you still there? I'm here. And, are there, we back? you sound good now. Now you're sounding good. Is that better or not? It's better. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you for pointing it out. Um, okay. I wonder what people missed. <laughs> um, I interrupted you as soon as it started, so just carry on. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Um, so, at any rate, part of the reason I chose to go fretless here um, was so that you could slide into notes easily and so that you could adjust as you play um, with that more forgiving intonation, which I think in the long run makes it easier to sort of hear what you're doing. Um, the other big modification here um, is to add a second string. Um, so the way this is set up to begin with is that there's room for two strings on the pickup, so they'll both be amplified equally. And the string you want to add is that, for example, if you use the G string, for your first string, which in this diagram is the one that is further towards the top of your screen. For the second string, you're going to use the string that's the next lowest pitch on a guitar. So that would be a D string. And in fact, you can see on my neck here that I've uh, marked out the major scale on the, this, the, the face has the blues scale. The top edge that's facing us has the uh, major scale and the bottom edge has the minor scale, and right there I'm, I'm barring a chord. Um, so what do you do with the second string? One, you can tune it to be the same note as the first string, but one octave lower, um, at which time you're just going to get a nice doubling and it'll function as a drone string, which means you can actually play all your melodies, strum them both, but play your melodies on the higher pitch string, and it'll sound um, kind of like a strum stick, which is a, a type of mountain dulcimer, so it'll be kind of that sort of sound. Or you can tune them a fourth apart. I've made this chart here because it's a sort of confusing music theory math. The point here is that um, when you bar like this and play both strings, if they're tuned a, a fourth apart, you're going to be playing an inverted power chord. Um, I only bring this up because uh, a lot of like grunge music and punk music is played in the drop D tuning on a guitar. Um, which is really conducive to playing inverted power chords. So if you're a Nirvana fan, most Nirvana songs are, most Nirvana songs I know of, this is not a definitive statement, are tuned in drop D, and so they're power chord based, and so you're going to kind of, you know, have the Nirvana, Nirvana guitar right there by adding the second string. This chart tells you what the two strings should be tuned to. Um, bam, and we're to Q&A. Just a few resources. If you decide you want to buy any supplies, um, especially that 42 gauge winding wire if you decide to go whole hog for the half pound <laughs> coil. Stuart McDonald, uh, stumac.com is like the go-to place for luthiers getting supplies. Um, they have good prices, they have great customer support, they have lots of cool stuff if you decide you want to expand what you're doing as far as building instruments. Um, the Snipburn Solder Blog is uh, at davideriknelson.com slash sbsb. Uh, in about two weeks I'll have a full tutorial with text and video on playing the blues on the diddly bow, although anything you look up about the blues will, will get you moving in the right direction. In fact, probably a lot of you will be able to plink it out the first time you try because you'll hear it and recognize it immediately. Um, and then the book itself is available
available from No Star to Press, and I'm told that O'Reilly has arranged for a really sweet coupon uh, for the book, which um, is a nice deal, and, and I applaud. And then on Twitter, I'm Squidavo. Um, a couple questions came in while I was nattering. Um, Marlene asks about adding some frets, which, which I think we hit on, but yes, you can totally add frets. You can fret it all the way out um, like a standard guitar. Again, um, folks I know have gotten good results using bamboo skewers for the actual frets. I'm not sure how well those hold up over time, um, but the sound is certainly good right off the bat. <laughs> Um, and if you want to go more permanently, light gauge wire is really what you're looking at. And I believe fret wire has, like the kind that you can actually buy a guitar shop, has a sharpened back edge to make it easier to set into place. Um, Michael asks, I've heard so much about the voodoo of winding pickups, like randomizing the windings versus having them neatly wound across the spool. Have you experimented with different winding layouts and noted different sounds from them? Um, I have experimented with some different windings because I got into this thinking it was going to be a terribly challenging, <laughs> a terribly challenging project, and I in fact did not believe it was going to work the first time. I was shocked when my first pickup, which I had screwed up and unwound and rewound, worked um, and actually sounded good. Um, I have noticed no appreciable difference, and that's kind of my point on voodoo: is that what you have to appreciate is is the source. Um, People who are having most discussions about pickup winding, they're not just casual makers because pickup winding is not a normal thing to do. Um, they're functioning at a very high level and they have very finely tuned ears um, because this is their profession and their passion. Um, for most of us who are experimenting and learning about this, we're going to be very happy with something that they would find really janky. Um, I think another piece of course is that we're using such grossly overpowered magnets and so few windings that a lot of differences that would come out if I had 5,000 windings are not coming out because I only have 1,500. Um, so that's my experience with that. Uh, Steve Chabra um, asks, it looks like the string travels down the neck at an angle. Is this an illusion or deliberate? Um, short answer is, well, I need to clarify which angle we're talking about. Um, the string is definitely at an angle in terms of its distance from the fingerboard um, because the saddle is higher than the nut. This is on purpose, and this is the case because I needed to clear the pickup um, because the pickup is sitting right on the surface of the fingerboard. Um, and it also, as you add frets, you have to start worrying about fret buzz. We don't have so much of that here, but you do worry when you're not fretting instrument at all about getting buzz off of the neck. So I wanted to get a little bit distance there. As far as if you're looking at it dead on, um, the string does travel at a bit of an angle down the neck because um, the tuning peg anchors it at one edge. If you're looking at it straight, the tuning peg's going to anchor it at the right edge. And then the string actually anchors at the other edge, at the bridge, right in the middle. Um, so there's going to be an angle as it travels down. Um, in uh, a guitar, like an archtop guitar, uses a similar kind of design in that there's a tailpiece holding the strings and the bridge, the saddle, um, is notched so that the strings play in, stay in place. And that's one of the purposes of the saddle and the nut is to keep the strings in place. Um, with um, relative to the edges of the neck. Yep, okay, now I'm on the right track. Thank you, Steve. Um, it is traveling at an angle here uh, because we haven't notched the saddle and the nut because it's unnecessary. Even as you go up to two strings, they're not going to interfere with each other. You can actually bring this up to three strings, um, which will make it just like a traditional cigar box guitar. At that stage, my suggestion is to do away with the uh, wood saddle and nut and replace them with two coarsely ground or coarsely uh, threaded bolts of comparable diameters. So like a three-eighths inch bolt that has coarse threading on it and uh, I think about a quarter inch bolt, which is a little bit harder to find coarse threaded, so like maybe like a, a drywall screw to replace the nut. And then those threads will help keep the wires in place, the wires, pardon me, the strings in place, so that your three strings don't interfere with each other down where they pass over the pickup. Um, so that was an extra bonus for today is adding yet another string. Um, are there any other questions out there? Wow, and I came in one minute under the wire. Super. Hey, Dave. That, hey. that was a great.
great presentation. I loved it. Oh, so, thank you very much. Perfect timing, too. So I, I'm just curious, all the people out there, how many of you are actually going to build this? <laughs> Starting this weekend, OK. Awesome. At least one guy is going to do it. So. Yeah, I, I really urge people, um, as they build, to like totally record some audio, some video, take pics. If you do any of that, drop me a line so I can add it to the gallery. I just love seeing like the adaptations people make and, and, and how they jump the hurdles of getting supplies you know, where they are and the things that are easier to find in your neighborhood versus my neighborhood. Yeah, so I did post the link to that um, video on YouTube. Let me see if I can find it again. OK, here it is. I made it live on YouTube. I, it wasn't originally, but Super. if you guys want to go watch that, go ahead and watch it. And um, Oh, we'll one more question came in. Oh. You still there? One more question came yeah. in I really would like to answer from Michael. How is it with the slide? Any higher action needed? It's awesome with the slide. <laughs> um, diddly bows, which is what this is based on, are, are traditionally slide instruments, um, and actually kind of the basis of the Delta-style blues sound with a slide guitar. Um, that's kind of uh, was another drive for me to put the action up high is that I like playing with the slide. And this sounds great with the slide. If you've never played with a slide before, you can actually do this instrument on your lap and play it like a... Um, like a lap steel guitar, and it's a really easy way to start out playing slide. And, and then, I mean, you can use anything as a slide, like old ketchup bottle, a beer bottle. Um, although if you go to your local guitar store, you can buy a guitar slide for a couple of bucks. And yeah, that's that was totally in mind with this design, is playing with a slide, because slides are awesome. So sorry, I'll, I'll give it back to you there, Kevin. <laughs> no, that's OK. Yeah, the, the YouTube video is very short. So um, we'll have this recording available for you, and we'll send everyone a link. And uh, as soon as we get it posted, that will probably be in a couple of days, so early next week. And let me think what else. If you can't download the PDF there, haven't been able to, just send an email to webcast at O'Reilly.com, and we'll send you a copy of the, the slides in PDF form. And I think that's about it. So Dave, I just want to thank you again. This was a great webcast, lots of fun. Awesome. And, uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank everyone for joining us. And remember, you can get you get Dave's book. Use the code. You, you can only use this code on O'Reilly.com. Uh, so he has oh. it listed on No Starch. But O'Reilly distributes No Starch, so you can get it there. Um, it gives you 40% off or 50% off the ebook, and it is a forecast, numeral 4, C-A-S-T. And, uh, and when you use that, it also helps support our free webcast program, so we appreciate it. OK, that's it. So I'm going to close out the, uh, the no, YouTube supports. We, we can support an hour uh, or longer of video on YouTube. It depends on your type of account. Anyway, thanks, everyone. We'll uh, awesome. hope you join us again soon. Thanks, Dave. Cool. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for, for coming in and spending an hour with me. It's been really great. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.